guys. Good to see you again. Um, you guys all know me. I'm Liz, and my mentor is Nisha Atari. She's here today with us, back from maternity leave. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> sorry, I missed one. <laughs> and my research is on outcomes of macular edema in non-infectious CVIs. So just to quickly review um, some background information on macular edema. Macular edema is basically edema or swelling of the macula, which is the part of the retina, the kind of like red spot right here that's responsible for your central vision. Um, and it's the most common complication you see in uveitis, as well as the leading cause of visual impairment. And it's an important and tough complication to treat because just because you have good control of ocular inflammation from your uveitis doesn't mean that your macular edema necessarily resolves. So you can have very well treated uveitis but still have vision impairment. So that's why it's a very important complication to treat well. So you can see macular edema visually on clinical exam, but many times it's hard to see. And so the OCT or the optical coherence tomography is a very useful tool to both diagnose and clinically follow macular edema. So this image here is an OCT scan, it's a cross-sectional image of the macula, and this center of depression here is the fovea. And this is a very healthy, beautiful looking uh, macula. And this is the thickness, the cross-sectional thickness um, of the fovea or the macula. And it's, it can be a pretty good indicator of the severity of the edema. Uh, and as, as you can imagine, the greater the fluid is there, the thicker the retina is, and the more compromised the architectural integrity is. And you may also intuitively guess that the people who have the thickest retinas or the worst edema have the worst visual outcomes. But what we've actually found is that it's not so much how much fluid that accumulates that's important, but rather how the fluid accumulates. And it can accumulate in one of three patterns. The first is cystoid, where you can see these intraretinal cysts um, in the layers of the retina, and the, the fluid is the hyporeflective uh, dark spot. And diffuse is a second subtype where you kind of have diffuse thickening throughout the retina and an absence of cysts. And the third subtype is serous macular edema, or a serous retinal detachment, where you get the fluid above the retinal pigment epithelium, which is the red layer here, and uh, below the neurosensory retina. So, my research is going to be studying whether there are differences in outcomes based on these different subtypes. And so that kind of leads into my research question. So my data actually comes from a randomized control trial that was performed in India. And what they were looking at was um, uh, control of ocular inflammation as a primary outcome with either methotrexate or mycophenolate. So naturally, my first research question is looking at macular edema outcomes uh, in responding to either methotrexate or mycophenolate. Uh, my secondary research question is whether outcomes of macular edema differ by subtype, which is what I just talked about earlier, or whether they possibly differ by etiology of uveitis. And I'm gonna go into that a little bit later. And then finally, how much change can you expect in your visual acuity with a change in retinal thickness? And this is what's probably most important to patients. They probably don't care about their retinal thickness as much as whether they can actually see or not. So these are my three research questions. And to do a quick overview of my methodology, so for this trial, there were 80 patients that were randomized to either methotrexate or mycophenolate. This was all done in India. And they were followed monthly for six months. And at the end of the six months, we measured various outcomes. So for my study, I looked at three different outcomes um, for macular edema. The first being percent change in retinal thickness, the second being improvement of macular edema, and that's defined as a 20% reduction in retinal thickness, and it's a dichotomous variable. And the last one is resolution, which is normal retinal thickness as well as no fluid seen on the OCT. So both of those have to be true. So before I go into results, I wanted to talk about uh, vote koyanagi harada disease for two reasons, the first being I don't remember ever learning this in med school, and in the US there are a good number of cases, as well as a good number of cases each year here at UCSF, <coughs> so I think it's good to talk about. And the second reason is, in India, a lot of the patients who have uveitis have a diagnosis of VKH. And so in our study, there were a lot of patients, especially with serous macular edema or serous retinal detachments, 
who had this diagnosis. And so I'm going to be looking at this disease as one of the factors in the outcome. So VKH is an autoimmune disorder characterized by granulomatous uveitis, often found with serous retinal detachment. And here is a picture of the retina with what you see on exam is a serous retinal detachment. And it is thought to be T cell mediated with a lot of helper T cells basically attacking melanocytes that contain melanin or like the pigment. Um, it can be associated, but not always, with neurologic um, or cutaneous manifestations. And examples of neuro symptoms are meningismus. Uh, up to 75% of people can have auditory symptoms like tinnitus or vertigo. Um, and more rarely, encephalopathy or focal signs like cranial nerve palsies or hemiparesis. The cutaneous symptoms include alopecia, uh, poliosis, which you can see here and here, which is like decreased or absence of melanin in the melanocytes of different parts of uh, hair on the body, and vitiligo as well. And these neuro and dermatologic symptoms, um, you know, aren't very reliable. They're not always there, but the ocular symptoms are pretty reliable if you know to look for them or if you think to get them off the console. So that's something to keep in mind for you guys. Um, and finally, it's most common in Asians, Middle Easterners, Hispanics, and Native Americans. And so that's why we have a good number of patients uh, with VKH. All right, so for some interesting results. So my first research question was really comparing methotrexate with mycophenolate. And you see the three outcomes I talked about here on the left column. And the first thing you might notice is I don't have any significant p-values. Uh, however, if you take a closer look at methotrexate um, and compare that to mycophenolate, you'll see that you know, the percent change in retinal thickness was greater than mycophenolate. The improvement, the proportion of patients who had improvement and resolution were much higher. So we probably didn't have enough power to actually detect a difference. But these results, this trend, also corresponds to the primary outcome in the study, which was control of ocular inflammation. They saw the same trend. Um, and right now, we've just um, started the actual like multi-center this was a pilot study. So we've started the multi-center randomized control trial to, that is powered to detect a difference if there really is one. And as a side note, uh, for a percent change, I did choose to use median and interquartile range because I had a lot of outliers, which would have affected the mean. And so this gives you kind of a more accurate picture of the median. Okay, so for a subtype. Uh, so here I have cystoid and diffuse and serous on top. You can see that my sample sizes aren't very balanced, which is one limitation. And the first things I wanted to look at uh, more closely were the thickness at baseline, the thickness at study completion, which was five and or six months, and the percent change between the baseline and, and, the, and six months. And so what you'll see is baseline, there's no significant difference, which is what you would expect. And then at study completion, uh, what you see is the serous has a much lower retinal thickness. Uh, it's hard to really conclude anything about diffuse since I only have four eyes in this group, um, but you do see a significant p-value. And for all of these statistical analyses, I used um, mixed effects modeling. Uh, does anyone remember why I use, had to use that instead of using an, any, an ANOVA or chi-squared? It was the fact that you were seeing patients multiple times, is that right? Really close. So um, all of my samples are eyes, and I had, in some cases, I had two eyes from the same patient. And mm. an ANOVA and chi group requires that all the samples be independent. And in this case, if you have two eyes in the study, the same person, same disease, they respond to treatments probably very similarly. So those are not independent. The so mixed effects modeling is a way to kind of account for this correlation between eyes from the same person. And so this p-value, uh, what it tells you is that subtype, in this model, subtype does kind of affect the outcome. And you can kind of, uh, you can do further analyses to determine that it's serious, that's actually really significant. Um, you see a similar trend in percent change. And then for my other two outcomes, improvement and resolution, these were the dichotomous variable. Very similar trend. It's amazing how many serious patients actually resolve uh, completely. And you have a significant yeah. Is this, I know you said these are the number of patients you got, but is this distribution kind of indicative of the population? Like, is there more serious than diffusing cystoid in general? Actually, no. So, oh, okay. 
part of the reason why I had so many serious patients was because those serious patients had a VKH diagnosis, and that's inherently a characterization of the disease. And so we happen to have a lot of VKH patients, so we happen to have a lot of serous. But I think in the literature, you see a lot uh, like cystoid and diffuse edema, and for people with chronic uveitis, um, the chronic inflammation causes usually cystoid and diffuse patterns as opposed to serous patterns. So yeah, good question. Though. So we're in India, that's the reason why. We're in in India, mm, okay. Because VKH. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In India. Because the yeah. population. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty common here actually too. So it depends where you look. All right, so next I wanted to look at etiology, specifically VKH. I had a lot of other diseases in the mix, like Bichette's, uh, retinal vasculitis, idiopathic uh, uveitis, but since there were so few, I just kind of clumped them into non-VKH. And I looked at the same thing, so baseline, study completion, and the percent change between baseline and six months. And again, baseline, you don't see a difference, which is what you expect. And then at the end of the study, it was highly significant with BKH having a much lower retinal thickness. And you can see the overall percent change is also dramatically lower. And for my other two outcomes, very similar trend, great recovery with BKH, and not as much, not as reliable with other diagnoses. Okay, so this figure I thought is really nice because it shows you basically every single eye that is in my study. And I have, you know, subtype on the x-axis, percent change on the y-axis, uh, and I also differentiated between the VKH and non-VKH patients. So one of the first things you might notice is the cystoid patients, or the cystoid eyes, are kind of all over the place. It's not really predictable uh, whether there's going to be a great reduction or not with therapy. And the second thing you might notice is that I have very few people in the diffuse group, so it's really hard to make any conclusions there. And then the third thing is you have this huge clump of eyes that are serous, that have serous retinal detachments, and the majority of those are BKH patients. And so I think this really illustrates the concept that the serous retinal detachments and BKH are collinear. Um, and it's kind of a statistical term, but basically it means that I can't put BKH and serous into the same model. In other words, I can't put this etiology and this subtype into the same model because they're inherently linked. VKH is inherently defined as having a serous retinal detachment. And so if I put both into a model, a model can't figure out, is it the etiology that's explaining the outcome or is it the subtype of macular edema explaining the outcome? And so all I can really do is do separate analyses and um, kind of see the overall, the overall trends. Any questions about that? Okay. All right. So I wanted to show you this picture um, because I think it's a really amazing recovery. So these are two eyes, right and left eye, from a VKH patient at baseline. You can see it looks like horrendous compared to the normal healthy retina you saw at the beginning. And after six months of therapy, what you see is pretty much a very normal living retina, and it's pretty remarkable. Um, the one caveat, I guess, is that just because you have a normal, healthy looking retina doesn't always guarantee your vision's going to be perfect if you've already had irre irreversible tissue damage. But this is this looks pretty good. Okay, and the last thing. So as I kind of mentioned earlier, uh, retinal thickness is great to talk about and to study, but if we don't really know how to translate what we see on the OCT to something that the patient really cares about, which is their vision, um, it's not as helpful. So what we want to know is how much change can you expect in your visual acuity with a change in retinal thickness? And in the past, there have really only been retrospective case uh, studies that have looked at this, and they can really only say this thickness equates to this visual acuity. But with retrospective data, you can't really track change over time and make any conclusions about that. So this is one study uh, from the multi-center UVI steroid treatment trial. Uh, it's the only study I know uh, thus far to kind of look at this, and they wanted to determine, you know, how much change can you expect in your vision with a change in retinal thickness. And what they found was that a 20% reduction in your retinal thickness is pretty much equivalent to at least a 10-letter improvement. Um, and if you, it's like two lines on the eye chart if you're at the optometrist, this is what you normally see. 
so to like a pretty significant improvement. And the way they did this was they basically graphed these dots are all of their eyes, all of their samples, and they have x-axis, uh, percent change on the x-axis and improvement in visual acuity in letters on the y-axis. And so basically the more negative you have, the greater reduction you have, the greater improvement you're going to see, the more letters you'll be able to see by the end of the study. And what they tried to do was actually do a sensitivity and specificity analysis. Oh, sorry. You have a question? No, I just had a quick question. Yeah. Um, in measuring the retinal thickness, is yeah. that just looking at the phobia because you're concerned about visual acuity, or is that like averaged across the whole OCT scale? It's OC, well, it's the macula specifically. And there are different ways you can measure. You can either measure um, like a pinpoint on the fovea or kind of like a small radius. And so sometimes studies will differ, but it is mostly just in the macula. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So they wanted to do a sensitivity and specificity analysis where they basically asked if you have a 20% reduction in your retinal thickness, is that most sensitive and specific for a five letter improvement, a 10 letter improvement, or a 15 letter improvement? And they kind of draw these lines that are hard to see. And their conclusion was that a 10 letter improvement here um, is the most sensitive and specific for a 20% change in retinal thickness. And I think conceptually, it's kind of hard to think of sensitivity and specificity in these terms. So I think another way to look at it is, if you look at these reference lines that I kind of drew in, you have four quadrants, and you're trying to maximize the points in the upper left quadrant and the lower right quadrant. And this is the most sensitive and specific. So what I'm gonna be doing in my research is very similar. I'm gonna make the exact same figure, but instead of doing a sensitivity and specificity analysis, I'm gonna do a regressions model to try to find that actual correlation and see how it compares to this. And the interesting point is all of their patients were cystoid and diffuse macular edema uh, eyes. And most of mine are serous. So it'll be interesting to see if I have a similar correlation with these different subtypes. And so that's what I'll be doing next. And um, I'm writing an abstract and submitting it to ARPA, which is a big research conference for OPPO this week. And I'll be writing the paper, and I'll also be examining some quality of life measures from the same. Yeah, do you guys have questions? It's been an understudied area. You know, I know it's very specific, but in our field, macular edema is the biggest cause of vision loss. And, um, you know, the MUST trial was the only, that was an NEI sponsored trial, and that was the only trial that's looked at this, and, and our pilot study was like the second, you know, but it's a different population, different types, and mm -hmm. this is helping to implement the larger trial as well, in yeah, addition to helping with all this pilot data. It's cool. We have a lot of different centers on board. Right. It's cool. Yeah. All over the world. So yeah. It'll be more diverse than just India. And what's the end of that trial versus the pilot study? 216, that's a lot bigger. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, can't justify it. I wish it were smaller, but you know, we need the power. Yeah, What's the standard of care here for EDS? Uh, Nisha can kind of jump in, but I think normally, it kind of depends on the disease. So like if the underlying etiology is an immune, autoimmune disease, most often the first line therapy is steroids, and so you'll often see improvement of the uveitis with steroids. But as you know, a lot of autoimmune diseases are chronic things. You can't cure them. And it's not a good idea to put someone on steroids for the long term. And so that's why they're trying to look at, you know, do these immuno these other immunosuppressants like mycophenolate or methotrexate, are those also effective? Um, they may be effective for the underlying etiology, but we're not sure if they work as well for macular edema. And often they don't. And so um, sometimes people do intravitreal steroid injections so that you don't have at least like systemic effects from like oral like prednisone. Um, and that seems to do rel relatively well, but there hasn't, there isn't any like immunosuppressant or steroid that really resolves macular edema very reliably, which is what makes it like so difficult um, in an area of study. And there's no trials on macular yeah, edema. Yeah, and we just put in a grant with MUST that I'm doing also mm -hmm. to hopefully do macular edema trials because we don't know. Mm -hmm. All of our, our trials are a couple trials that are doing a focus on the underlying information. 
everything has side effects, right? We don't know. So systemic versus you can give shots in the eye, but you'll get high pressure and cataracts if you inject steroids, you know, um, a couple times. You'll develop glaucoma and cataracts from that. So has there been any, any rule? Is there any rule for biologics? Yeah, so when we fail with these traditional agents, I use a lot of biologics in my clinic, and I would love to study them. That's what I want to do for the next career. If we can get through this trial, <laughs> we have to first show that we can yeah. do traditional therapy, but I really want to do a trial someday in the near future on biologics. They're all off-label. So everything's off-label, right, for you guys, including, believe it or not, the only, we have not a single therapy that's FDA approved for our entire field. Wow. It's really, really sad because it's not a, there's not a financial incentive from pharmaceutical companies to get that label, right? They are all marketed for um, rheumatologic conditions. Mm -hmm. So we just, the problem is we just have to use them and try to come up with data to see what works and doesn't work. It doesn't translate directly from, you know, rheumatology to the eye. For example, Enbrel, you know, which is used for, you know, you guys know what that is, right? It does not work for the eye at all. In fact, it probably makes it worse mm -hmm. on the eye. That took years to figure out, but that's a pretty solid, um, Fat now, so it doesn't it doesn't translate directly. So we need studies, you know, in our field, but they're not being done by pharma, and so it really comes down to like you know funding agencies that believe in in this to really fund us. But it's hard to do these trials because it's a relatively rare disease, so it takes a lot of centers and people and time. And will, I mean, you have to well, advocate. Yeah, will to get these drugs. <coughs> or to get the and to get, there. get them funded too. Yeah. To get them funded, yeah, because you know it's not as big as like macular degeneration. You know that's what all the resources go in, right? The, the big diseases. But you know we see people every day here from all around who are going blind, you know, from these things. And I do think it's treatable. You know, it's a lot better than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But we are still. I mean, we are practicing like trial and error medicine. You know, this isn't right to be doing that. We shouldn't be doing that, right? should know because the more time you waste with one drug if it's not working you know you're just wasting all that time maybe we should go to biologics first i think you you know for side effects if you think the right side effects true but you know well, people I, blind you don't i don't know, know. Yeah, you, know? you don't know you don't know you have to weigh that into it but i think looking at side effects tolerability quality of life all of that together cost you know there's a lot of issues to look at yeah any other comments 